My name is Fahim Tonmoy. I'm, I'm the Coastal Zone Specialist here at NCARF. And uh, today in, in this session, I'll talk about uh, the climate change risk assessment process in uh, Coast Adapt. While doing that, I'll uh, try to show you how different uh, data sets, uh, guidance, and templates that are available through Coast Adapt can be used in uh, this process. Let me uh, first uh, start by uh, showing you how we laid out the uh, risk assessment process in Coast Adapt. So we have three levels of risk assessment, uh, first pass risk screening, second pass risk assessment, and third pass uh, risk assessment. So why do we have three levels? Mainly because uh, organizations often have limited resources that they can invest in uh, climate change risk assessment type of work. That's why we created a, a low cost uh, fast pass risk screening that uses existing national and state level information and can provide users a high level information about their uh, future climate change risk. It can help them to identify uh, assets and geographical areas that might be at risk in future. And more importantly, it can help identify stakeholders that uh, can be, that they need to engage with down the track in the second pass risk assessment. So, uh, so once you identified uh, the relevant stakeholders through fast pass risk screening, second pass risk assessment is about getting those stakeholders in a room and conducting a risk workshop while you uh, identify specific risk, and then you go through uh, uh, the likelihood and consequence of each risk and come up with a risk register. And the risk register will essentially tell you that some of the risks are <clears throat> more important for you and some of them are not so much. And as you identified any critical risk through second pass risk assessment, third pass assessment is about narrowing down to that particular risk to at a site specific level and then engage with a consultant to commission hazard studies so that consultant can build some biophysical models and can tell you more detail about the rate and appropriate uh, approximate time in future of future changes so that you can start thinking about thresholds and, uh, and, and triggers and that can you ultimately use for planning your uh, adaptation actions down the track. And in, in Coast Adapt, we have a section uh, called Risk Assessment, and that gives you access to a, a different uh, detailed guidelines for all, for all these different levels of risk assessment. This also provides you other information like available templates, tools, and data that you can use in this purpose. It also provides you a, a useful guide which can help you to identify which uh, map you can use, which, what, what, what is the appropriate map to use in a particular type of risk assessment. So that's uh, about the overview of uh, risk uh, assessment process in Coast Up. Now today we won't ha have time to go through all the three levels of risk assessment. I'll just give you an overview of fast pass risk screening and uh, we'll give a quick uh, summary of a second pass towards the end. So in fast pass risk screening, as you can see, the, the four steps are, are uh, these are the four fundamental steps of fast pass screening which are quite similar to ISO 31000 uh, risk management process. These are step one, you scope your assessment, and step two, you identify your existing risk, and step three, you identify your future climate change related risk, and in step four, you evaluate those risks and uh, come up with a strategy. So in, while doing step one, it's all about framing it, it's, uh, identifying the object, objective, identifying your scale, do you want to do it for your whole council or you're part of your council for your whole business or part of your business. You need to decide what sort of time frame you want to investigate in future. And you also need to uh, decide what climate change scenario you want to investigate uh, in, in future. And the selection of time frame and climate change scenarios can often be interrelated. As an example, uh, if you think about time frame, if you're doing a risk assessment for a transport infrastructure or dam or a bridge, then your planning horizon more likely to be more than over 50 years. On the other hand, if you're doing a risk assessment for a tourism business, this time frame more likely to be quite smaller, like 10 to 15 or 20 years. <clears throat> so your selection of time frame depends on what systems you are actually looking at. And your selection of climate change scenarios can be guided by a number of things. <clears throat> First, your state's uh, preference, your state can give you a benchmark that you have to follow, specifically for sea level rise. The second thing is uh, your time frame that you have chosen. If you have chosen a time frame 
which is within next 10 to 15 years, then you can see that there's not much difference between red and blue, blue, blue line, which are the higher and lower emission scenarios. So you can easily select high emission scenarios if your time frame is quite short. But if your time frame is uh, beyond 2050, then you can see the uh, emission scenarios start to diverge and you can probably want to uh, investigate uh, multiple scenarios, a high emission or a moderate emission scenarios. Third driving factor for uh, scenario selection is the criticality of your system. If your system is highly critical, you want to investigate a high emission scenario because you want to identify the worst case uh, uh, possible situations. And in Coast Up, we have a section called Future Climate Data, which provides a range of information about uh, climate change scenarios, their access, use, and interpretation. So that's a very good source of information. So in step one, you have identified your uh, objective scale and you have selected what time frame and scenario you want to use in your assessment. So in second step, it's about identifying your existing climate-related risk. So is it essentially uh, working with uh, local knowledge, people who have local knowledge and expert no uh, local expertise, and basically try to find out what sort of uh, previous hazards has happened in your area in the past. You might find that you, there are certain areas in your council that are already erosion prone, or you might have some areas that are already uh, uh, getting inundated during high tides. And if you don't have any risk management strategy uh, for uh, tackling those existing for example, erosion or uh, inundation-related issues, that means there is a, a existing residual risk in your system regardless of climate change. And as I mentioned, the, the most important uh, uh, data that you can use in this step is local knowledge and talking to uh, local experts. And another data product from Coast Adapt, uh, which is water observation from space, can be used as well. It, that can provide you a... Uh, I, I help you to identify areas that have been far flooded in the uh, past. So in, as you, in step two, we have identified your existing risks. Now step three is about identifying your future climate change related risk and opportunities. So if I give an example, let's say you have identified uh, in step one, you have decided that you want to investigate high emission scenario at 2050. And in step two, you have identified that you have some areas that already been uh, getting flooded during high tide. So in step three, you would want to investigate an inundation map of 2050 of high emission scenario, and we would want to identify areas that might be at risk in future. And you can do the same thing for other different types of hazards like uh, uh, heat waves or erosion uh, to identify any future at risk uh, areas or assets. And there are a number of data sets that you can use from Coasted Up for this purpose, like uh, uh, sea level rise uh, projections for each coastal councils, inundation maps for each coastal councils, and again, uh, uh, temperature and uh, rainfall extreme projections. This is also available for uh, each coastal council in Australia. There are certain data sets, national data sets, that are sitting outside Coasted Up like Coast Climate Risk Australia, you can use those sort of data set in this particular step and we can get access to them from uh, this page of Coast We also invited each step to have their own state-specific page where they can list their state-specific data sets and uh, guidelines and policies. So you can check out your state-specific page as well to find out any uh, state-specific data that might be useful in this uh, particular st step three of risk assessment. So once you identified our existing and future risk, step four is about just evaluating those risks, identifying which risk matters most to you and which not so much. And the outcome of that particular uh, whole exercise can be a list of geographical areas or a list of infrastructures that you think that might be at risk in future. And more importantly, a list of stakeholders that uh, come out of this exercise that you need to get engaged with down the track to make your adaptation progress uh, further. There are an, uh, four uh, templates in Coast Adapt that can be used for risk assessment purpose. And these four different templates has uh, different purpose and different levels of complexity. And each of the templates have a read me section that you can uh, read and, uh, and that will tell you when to use a particular template and what to do in, uh, while doing that. So that's all about fast pass risk screening in a very quick summary. I want to give you a very uh, quick overview of a second pass uh, risk assessment. 
just to give you a head start. So, so in, in first part assessment, you have identified a number of assets and geographical areas and sectors that you think might be at risk in future, and you have also identified a range of stakeholders that you need to get engaged with. Now in second part assessment, you have to get those stakeholders in a room to conduct a risk workshop and follow the second pass. Uh, process and the, and the steps are exactly the same as the fast pass risk screening as you can see, but the things that you do inside this step are quite different. As an example, in step one where you're scoping the uh, second pass assessment, yeah. your scope has to be narrower. As an example, you might have found out that tourism and roads are the two sectors that might be at risk in future through your fast pass assessment. Second pass assessment should focus only on those two uh, narrowed down uh, sectors. And step two and three, where you identified your existing and future risk, are uh, uh, again different in second pass assessment. In fast pass assessment, both these steps were kind of binary, where you identified yes or no, whether you had a past event, whether you will have a future risk or not. But in second pass assessment, it's more about uh, a, doing a qualitative assessment. It's more you, you, you try to identify the, whether the impact was moderate or insignificant or it will have a significant impact. Specifically, step three is quite crucial because in that particular step, you go through likelihood and consequence of each individual risk. And discussing consequence with your stakeholders in a risk workshop is very important and critical because in, while doing discussing consequences, you will discuss about different interdependency among different risk, interdependency between different business processes and infrastructures, as well as you will also discuss about uh, adaptive capacity of particular systems so that you can think about uh, how your system might, uh, might, uh, might, cap might be capable of adapting to a particular hazard. And step four is about uh, evaluating those identified risks against certain uh, evaluation criteria. And we often found that this particular step risk evaluation has been uh, performed badly by uh, mo uh, most of the organizations. It's mainly because when you are doing a risk evaluation, uh, those criteria should focus on issues and aspects that are important for the organizations, such as their corporate objectives. If uh, climate change risks are evaluated against a new set of criteria rather than organizations existing uh, uh, cri uh, risk evaluation criteria, then it's difficult. Uh, it becomes challenging to mainstream the identified risk within organizations' business process. So the advice is stay uh, as close as possible to your existing uh, organizational uh, risk criteria, terminologies, and scales rather than adopting something new. So, so that's uh, the overview of a quick overview of a second pass assessment. I haven't showed you any uh, examples, so but we do have some examples. We have uh, commissioned uh, uh, some uh, projects with uh, a number of uh, organizations in Australia who have used cost up data and uh, guidelines to do a different types of risk assessment. So please do look out for those uh, uh, reports. Those are available from our case study sections and uh, they are a good source of information about getting a hands-on uh, example of doing the risk assessment. And uh, that's all from my end. Uh, so, so far I have showed how to conduct and identify uh, different climate change risk. Now in the next session, Anne will tell you how to communicate those identified risks to your relevant stakeholders.